So the talk tonight is about future of fuels. And um, just as a looking at this, you can see that uh, fuel is a very big on everybody's mind tonight. Um, it's what we spend all of our money on. I mean, I don't know about you, but I filled up my gas tank just recently, and it was way too much money. So going forward, we, we want to change that. And there's a couple things that we can do with that. Um, our big one, of course, what I'm involved in is biodiesel. Biodiesel can be made, as I have up here, you can see it, production from food crops, production from waste, production from biomass, and um, energy return, which is a very important part, the energy return. You can make a lot of great chemicals to run your car, but can you get your energy you put in back out? Um, and that, that is kind of the entire background behind this company is why you know, I came to Seattle as we look at the energy return. And the waste oil gives us our best energy return. But let's start with the food crops. Um, of course, everybody here is very f probably fam familiar with biodiesel, the name, but it's being made primarily from seed crops. Corn, sun canola, sunflower oil. I mean, all that can make biodiesel itself. But we're taking food off the table and um, feeding it. The main when you're making it out of seed crops, your main money you're making out of it is food back to cows. You extract the oil, then you feed the, the, the meal back to cows. And so your real product there when you're making it out of seed crops is feed. The oil is just a secondary byproduct, so it, the oil becomes expensive and it's not economically feasible to use. Production from waste, there's lots of waste, and we'll go specifically in the waste here in a minute, but um, it's really what I like to think of and do is waste to energy, not food for fuel. Um, and I know there's a huge controversy over fuel, food for fuel, and that's, I mean, I'd just rather avoid the entire controversy and produce all of our, the oil we need here in Seattle. And, well, we could do it for almost the entire United States from our waste streams. Um, now, and then we get to the biomass, which is the big hot topic. We got biomass, we got cellulosic. We've got um, food waste. I mean, I'm sure all of you have thrown the, the bread, the extra French fries away here. Um, that there's a huge amount of food waste we have here in, in, in just the restaurant industry. Um, and, and we have a huge amount of cellulosic. Microorganisms are like yeast and E. coli. Um, if we go to the next one, I like yeast. Um, it's what I did in biotech. Yeast itself is a great, great organism. 20 minute doubling time um, compared to algae, which does great produce great oil, but has a four hour doubling time. So if you just take the doubling time alone, even if yeast is only at a 20% yield, which as you can see from the research up here, you can get it up to a 49% yield on cellulosic biomass. And with optimal conditions, you can get 23.41 grams per liter, which is a 60% yield. But if you take just the, the, the production time between algae and yeast, you're, you can do a 10% yield on yeast and still produce more oil in a day than you can do out of algae. The problem with yeast is they need a food source. So what can we use as food source? Well, here they're showing you cellulosic and food waste. And if we look at the city of Seattle, um, our waste is 80,000 tons of composted chip waste. That's like construction waste, that's yard waste, that's, that's a lot of waste, uh, you know. <laughs> that just really is a lot of waste. And then our yard waste is 72,000 tons. That's a lot of yard waste. That's your grass clippings, everything. And, that's, and, and both those are cellulosic waste. Uh, silos, xylanase, and all that can be produced from there. That's per year? Yeah, that's per year. Um, and these are older numbers, so we're actually more than that right now. Um, and then our food waste, 7,000 tons of food waste is thrown away in Seattle. That's huge. I mean, I can't even imagine 7,000 tons of food waste, but, and 5,000 of that is right directly from restaurants you're sitting in today. And that's not the oil, that's not the waste oil. We currently use the waste oil here in Seattle to make biodiesel. The company I work with does that, and we're doing it very efficiently. City of Seattle's working with us on that and everything, and, and it's it's a great way to use that waste stream, which is an already used waste stream. This food waste is not even used, and if you take a look back up to this yeast thing, all that food is mainly carbohydrates. 
when I have a steak, I eat my steak. I throw away the baked potato. I don't know about any of you, but I mean, <laughs> so it's all carbohydrates. Um, and that's what we can feed to our yeast is, is the carbohydrates themselves. Um, in that study, they used corn stalk and they produced a 17% lipid content. Tree leaves produced a 16%. And rice straw, which is very hard to digest and break down, produced 3.58%. The neat thing about this is that Iowa State is working with um, a bacteria that's discovered in the hot springs in our Yellowstone National Bar Park, bringing out an enzyme called extreme xylanase. Extreme xylanase breaks down cellulose, but it only is active at 50 degrees Celsius. So it takes a lot of heat. So they can put it in the, st in the corn, feed the corn to cows and other animals that need to be fed, and then the stalks themselves you heat up and they completely break down for feed. Uh, and the yields can go way up from here. They can almost become up to 60% uh, yield from, from there. So there's some really good research from Iowa State coming out of that. And it's why we need to fund science as just pure science. Somebody looking at that bacteria never would have looked at it if we didn't just go out there and fund this and look at things. Science can solve a lot of things, but it can't do it alone, of course. So we all need to look at how we can change. And um, that's kind of why I like biodiesel itself is that, um, here we skipped ahead, is biodiesel is a great energy return. Um, it is, if we take it from the waste oil, we almost get a 15 times energy return back into our cars in production and BTUs. It's a great energy return, carbon friendly fuel, and it works great. Another microorganism that I don't have listed here is, well, our wonderful E. coli. We all shudder at the word E. coli, but it's honestly the workhorse of industry. E. coli is what makes most of everything you use pharmaceutically. Um, from your antibiotics to uh, drugs out there is grown and genetically altered in E. coli and yeast. E. coli, they're putting these bacterial strains to produce oil from E. coli, and they produce a diglyceride that can be turned into biodiesel directly. Um, and, and again, that takes anything possible, and they have a 20-minute cycle time, which allows them to produce a whole lot more with lower yields. Next subject on here is ethanol. We all like alcohol. I mean, we're all here at a bar. We gotta love our alcohol. Thank you for the toast. Um, now again, this takes a food for fuel type approach on the first part of this. Types of sugar. Um, we have corn, beets, um, and then you got biomass with your xylose, your cellulosic, um, and then you got your microorganisms. And mainly, microorganism is that of um, yeast and um, bacteria. Uh, certain bacteria can produce it, uh, and and um, mainly though to get the highest yield is is yeast. Uh, the problem with it is simply the energy return. If you take all of the energy return, you're getting be at best 20% yield into your into your system, 80% water. So you got to get rid of all that heat energy in the water, which is has the highest heat capacity of almost anything we know. So it takes a lot of heat to distill ethanol out of the water system. Um, your sugar waste is again the food waste, 7,000 tons we have here in Seattle. We could be using that instead of food. It's a waste stream. The yeast don't care. They, they really don't care what they eat off of. They can eat whatever they want. Um, we can use that stuff and actually produce ethanol from our waste streams here in Seattle at a quite a large amount even to our current production. Ethanol is nice to a point. We can put up to 60% in our engines without modification. But it is, hydros it is hydroscopic. It absorbs water. It, you can never have pure ethanol. If you leave a, p a glass of ethanol out pure, it's going to go to 95%, 5% water. So you always have to mix it with something. Um, ethanol itself, I don't think is a great fuel. I think it's a great for polyethylene, plastics. Um, it's... And, and, and plastics themselves can be recycled back into ethanol. But uh, ethanol has a very low energy yield compared to gasoline, so I don't know if any of you have had those ethanol cars. You put them in, you get less mileage than when you're running gasoline, and then is it really more efficient? And it seems the only thing they put them out is big SUVs. Um, 
I don't know what is it, it was the car manufacturer's love with the SUV, but um, it's there. Um, we keep, they keep producing it, we keep buying them. So ethanol has seemed to lost its favor in the world. Uh, it was a big push a couple years ago, and it doesn't seem to be around anymore. As with any fuel that doesn't make economical sense, the subsidies from the government can only take it so far. And that's the nice thing back to biodiesel, is why I'm working biodiesel now, is that we don't require government subsidies to survive. We can, be, we can be competitive with diesel fuel, and we don't ask people to change just buy a diesel vehicle. That's it. Um, so it's, and they can put it in and run it directly as it is. Um, the next real subject is butanol. Butanol, I'm a fan of butanol. It's a lot of energy to extract, but butanol is a, it's a great little story behind butanol. Butanol was made as a parts cleaner back in the 1920s, bacterial fermentation. It was fermented by this little bacteria here. And it produced acetone and ethanol. I didn't show ethanol up there. I'm sure you're all familiar with alcohol by now. I've been familiar with it since I was 21, maybe a little before that. But um, yeah, it produces acetone and ethanol. Acetone was the big thing they were producing from it. But butanol was a side product, a waste product at the time. Henry Ford ran his first car off of butanol, drove it around everywhere. Rockefeller came up to him at that time. Rubber was produced from trees. Rockefeller says, I have gasoline. You need to buy it. Otherwise, I'm not going to give you rubber for your tires. So we started using gasoline in our cars. You can all blame the Rockefellers. Uh, I do for everything. Um, but so he stopped. Then butanol in World War II became butyl rubber. So now it becomes the rubber that he got denied in World War II. So it came full circle. And then up to 1950, we were producing all of the rubber in America, synthetic rubber, through bacterial fermentation. Millions and millions of gallons of butanol was put in. It's not new technology. A lot of this technology that we have out here today is not new. It's not magic. It's not something that we have to have really high-tech things to put together. It's basic fermentation. We've been brewing beer since Egypt, Mesopotamian. You know, it's, that's all we have to do. Um, this bacteria is actually the same family that gives you botulism. Um, and it's not hard to grow. It's a very simple process. You grow it anaerobically, oxygen-free, and it produces this stuff, and you distill it off, and you can capture the energy from it. Butanol can go into your cars without any change to your engine. It doesn't absorb water. It can go as replacement for jet fuel. It's already EPA approved for jet fuel. It has a high energy yield and higher octane than gasoline. The problem is, is the bacteria only produces that 1% level, so we have to grow a lot of bacteria. Um, what was that, sir? Um, I'm not sure what the octane rating of, of, the, of the butanol is itself. Um, I think it's in around in the hundreds. Uh, it all depends on the, te the test itself. And last but not least is our hydrogen. Hydrogen itself is a great source. It comes from abundance. I mean, everything has hydrogen in it. We've all heard of the methanol economy. That's actually a hydrogen economy, but we're using methanol as our hydrogen carrier. Um, it produces lots of energy return. You, if you're taking it at the site, when we currently transmit our electricity over our power lines, we lose 90% of our energy when we get to our lights here in Seattle. It's just that much resistance in the electrical lines. If you produce the hydrogen at the power generation source, you can circumvent all that and transport the hydrogen around. The problem about that is hydrogen is very acidic. It's acid, basically. I mean, anything with a hydrogen donor is an acid. So now we've got acid pumping around, which, of course, cannot run in our current steel pipe system. And it's so small that the plastic pipes allow for it to transmit right out, so we can't transport it over a long ways. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. The question is, it takes more energy to produce hydrogen than it does to make it. It produces less energy than it does to make it. And that's true with everything, including biodiesel, ethanol, butanol. If you take the sun energy or the energy you have to put into something, total amount, and if you have to include the sun into that, 
uh, on these on the food waste, you're gonna you're never gonna have a positive energy return on anything. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. First law of thermodynamics. So we always are gonna be on the losing end of energy. The question is, is how can we mitigate that losing end? How free is that energy on the other side? Now, if we use solar energy, a solar cell takes 10 years to reproduce the energy it takes to make that solar cell. So you got 10 years of use. Most solar cells only have five to 15 years of use, depending on the conditions they're used in. So most solar cells don't even repay the energy back what it takes to make them. So with hydrogen, you can get up almost a 0.9 <laughs> energy return. You're not going to get 100%, but you can get a 0.9. The, it's called the hydrated electron theory. I don't know if anybody's heard of that. But basically, it's the amount of energy it takes to knock that electron off the hydrogen atom. Hydrogen atom is one proton, one electron. They're using high energy UV waves, around 650 nanometers, knocks that electron off, and then they can time it off. And it's in feptoseconds right now. Um, but that we, we are working towards reactors that can use solar energy to knock that hydrogen atom loose. A at that time, then it's going to become basically solar energy. Um, it's a problem of collecting that now. Because once you get that electron used from the water, you can get that hydrogen off, and then you have the hydroxyl group left over. And it gets really complex after that. People work on their PhDs for their lifetime on this thing. So uh, me working in biodiesel, I'm not the most expert on it. But it's really cool, the hydrated electron theory. The sources, though, can be also bacterial fermentation. If we use our food waste, feed it to the bacteria, acid forms, will produce hydrogen. If you can remove the methiogens, which are the bacteria that produce methane, they can, then you can capture that hydrogen gas and not make methane. But if you make methane, you can go through a, uh, an alcohol reaction on it, expose it to acid, and make a methanol out of it, and extract that hydrogen from methanol pretty easily. A lot of fuel cells are using methanol itself as the extraction source for the hydrogen, and then, and then goes back and forth. Um, I like hydrogen, I do, it's just not right now. I think it's going to be a great fuel economy for, the, for our cars, but not for trucks. Again, for our industry, people run on, on easy energy, low amount of energy, gasoline, but industry runs on biodiesel. It always has, it's going to for a long time. Diesel fuel itself has a high energy return, 182 BTUs. You're not going to get that much torque out of a gasoline engine. If a gasoline engine was that much more efficient, the big trucks would be doing it right now. Your locomotives are going across country on a diesel engine producing electricity. An electrical motor runs the locomotive across the, the country. It's not a gasoline engine. So as people, we can switch to a hydrogen economy. Industry is still going to be using diesel. It's just the most bang for the buck. And it's why I've chosen biodiesel as the start for changing the world as I see, see it as one thing at a time. Um, and that's the best way to do it is just change one thing. We can change things later, but we can't change it all. The question was, can you fly, fly jet engines? Yes, you can. The WSU has a bio jet fuel project. Um, we, as a company, are currently working with them and working with other people to do the biojet project. Um, it is, bio, the only thing that we need to do is um, make the lipid chains a little bit smaller. Um, they're currently a little large and they don't burn as easily, but it can work into jet fuel. The nice thing about butanol is you can take this molecule right here, put it in a jet engine and you can go. EPA approved already. It's not a high yield, but then again, jet engines, jet fuel is not as big as, as, normal, as, as normal fuel for trucks like biodiesel. We use 64 billion gallons of diesel fuel in this country. I don't even, can I don't even imagine 64 billion gallons. I don't know if you guys can, but anything over a million, I just kind of lose track. You know, actually anything over $100, I kind of lose track, you know, being a scientist. But butanol itself is, is a great jet engine fuel um, it, with no, nothing but um, simple um, distillation to get to it. Ye the, the, the problems with yeast, 
is that they produce what's called a steric acid, which is a long chain carbon in their fat. So it's, it's much like mammalian cell fat. They, they are uh, much uh, closest as neighbor as we can get into microorganisms. Most of genetics are run through yeast. So we have to genetically engineer the yeast to produce a better fat, so to speak. But there has been great research in that. Uh, the BCE research has produced yeast cells that are so fat that they explode with the amount of fat they produce. Um, so there's been some great research into that. And I think yeast is going to be one of those up and coming things that is going to come back and, and get to us. Uh, it's, it, it, it is one thing. Now, algae, I don't have a thing up here on algae. But um, I feel it's due that it's thing. Algae is good for removal of CO2 in the area. If you have a city, growing algae will remove that CO2 producing oxygen. It's great for cleaning up smog. It's great for cleaning up power plants. CO2 from power plants can be run through algae cleaning it up. It, it, you can take the sugars and produce ethanol from it. You can take the feed, the, the, the proteins and the mass and for feed for cows and for other um, farm animals. And you can produce the fat into biodiesel. But if you're looking just for to produce the fat into biodiesel, it's not very good. But if you're looking at the, at the whole product, algae has a very great use, and it's going to become a part of this. But it's not a fuel. It goes back to the feed and the sugars and the protein as the most valuable product itself. And the side product of your cleaning the air. In Seattle, we have wonderful air. I love it here in Seattle. I can breathe. Um, we have a lot of rain um, coming down, and it just cleans everything up. But if you go a little south to California uh, and, and you go into Hollywood, you can't even see the Hollywood sign on a, on a clear day because there's so much smog. That is where algae would become very useful to cleaning up the air. Um, we have the technology. It's nothing new. It's just application of technology. Biodiesel is nothing new. Biodiesel has been put out since the 1920s to, to look at fats by biochemistry. We're not doing you know, breakthrough science, what we're doing is using the technology we have to make something useful. And we have so much of that out there. As, as what I was saying with butanol, this is just one chemical that's being produced. If you look at bacteria and yeast, we can take our waste and produce all of our chemicals. All the stuff you use in society today is coming from petroleum. All the chemicals, you know, all your hair, hair dye, your, your hairspray, everything is coming from a petroleum product that can all come from our waste streams. I, I, I very advocate the waste streams. If we look at our waste streams, like I was saying, we have all of this waste that we can grow stuff off of. Fuel, chemicals, everything is coming from our waste stream. And when we're looking at future of fuels, we're looking waste to energy. Waste of fuel, waste of chemicals, taken and every dollar we keep here is a dollar spent here, not going overseas, not going anywhere else. It helps the economy the best. I mean, that's the greatest thing about doing these microeconomics and these local biofuels business is I know that every dollar that I take in here and make here, I spend here, and it totally cycles back into the community. And so it's, a, it's community supported. And, and I'm glad to see so many people in the community show up for this. So if we start using all our yard waste to make biofuel, what are we going to do for compost? That is a great question. And you'll have compost. Lots of compost because once we get the oil out of it, we've got to do something with that waste. And so it, go, it actually is broken down further than what you get for compost. So it's ready to go in your garden and you don't even have to let it sit around or, or sit for a year or so. You can just put it right in. Um, there's the, the, the oil process, that's the great part about using the waste, is that we don't interrupt the waste stream. We just get a product out of it before we get to break it down and, and put it somewhere else. And by breaking it down completely, the food waste doesn't get smelly or stinky or sitting in a big pile somewhere waiting to be broken down. Um, regarding biodiesel and... Um, locally produced 
vegetable oil, you know, waste oil, biodiesel versus commercially produced, grown in other countries and such. What do you see the public's knowledge level of that as far as the differences? Um, I know a lot of people are just, oh, biodiesel, if they see a gas station, they think that's good. What is your perception of the public's knowledge level of the differences? That's a good question. There is, what is the public knowledge? The public knowledge is very little. Um, they just see biodiesel and they think it's good. Um, and they don't, we don't know where stuff comes from. We're spoiled. We put the fuel in our tank and we take off. Um, we assume it's good quality fuel because it's being sold. We assume that it's, it's green if it's biodiesel or has the word bio on it. We assume that it's got good economic practices and we assume a lot. It's the, the public needs to be informed that using it from waste oil is putting the money back into society, our own society, and getting biodiesel from waste oil is right now the best economical feasible way of doing it and most greenest because we get three, 15 times energy return out of our biodiesel bio that way. If you do it from plant food production, you only get about three times energy return and the money's going to multinational corporations and shipped all around. So you're basically feeding the petroleum company if you go for the, you know, plant-based biodiesel. Hi, so I have one of those stupid questions that people said was not too stupid, but in my defense, I don't drive, so I don't really go to gas stations, but where can you get biodiesel? Is it in every gas station? Currently, the state of Washington is mandating a 2% in biodiesel in your diesel fuel. Biodiesel solves the low centane value of low sulfur diesel. So you can pretty much get biodiesel anywhere. Um, Seaport sells B100, so you can drive down there and pick up you know, a B100. They have a mixing tank, so you can select your grade of a 20%, 50%, or 100%. And that's just, I believe, right down on... Um, right down in West Seattle, right, um, I'm not too familiar with the Seattle area, but it's on um, Magnolia, I believe. Some right in Ballard, too, as well. Some in Ballard, too, as well. And that's not a stupid question. It's a very good question, because I'm sure those of us that want to get it need to know where. I guess I have two questions um, that are related. Inter are you saying that right now we can use cellulose and yeast to make biodiesel? And then the other question is, if that's true, what is the cost, you know, per gallon using that technique? Because I, I thought it was like this was way off into the future. The, sh the, the question is, is, can we use yeast to make biodiesel? And what's the cost? Cellulose. Yes, we can use yeast. The cost? I'm a scientist. I'm sorry. I don't know the real cost. Um, but it's just fermentation. It's, it's how we make our beer. If you're all drinking beer tonight and, and you can pay a little bit for beer, it's, not gonna, it's no different in the technology. I mean, we can brew lots of beer. We can brew lots of biodiesel. Um, it's, it's no different in how you make it and feed it and whatever. This is the study. This, this study actually came out of China. Um, and it's, it's, this is real. This is not some made-up thing. And these are the real numbers they got. With optimized conditions, they got a 60% yield of lipids, which out of the bacteria, and it, and if you take the and resulting in 23.41 grams per liter. So yeast are grown in a liquid medium. So for every liter, you get 23 grams of of, of fluid, which it, of of biodiesel itself that you can make. And if you the 60% comes from the yeast itself. If you extract the yeast, it's very small amount of the liquid itself. Um, but as you extract it, you can grow more. Like I was saying, yeast doubling time is 20 minutes. So if you start off with one yeast cell, it doubles to two. It then again doubles to four. So you get four yeast cells from one yeast cell in one hour. Um, doubling time from algae is four hours. So it takes 16, 12 hours to do what yeast did in one hour for algae. So that's one of the great thing about yeast. It's, it's very efficient. But like I said, algae itself can work too. 
But um, there's a story out there, the guy that paid $500 for one gallon of algae oil, it cost him that much to produce one gallon of algae oil, and it wasn't very high quality oil. So all of this takes properly applied technology and properly applied science to make it inexpensive. Uh, what's your opinion of um, other thermochemical conversion pathways like uh, pyrolysis or gasification in comparison to uh, like the you know biochemical fermentation pathways? Like uh, my impression of fermentation is that it's s slower in comparison to some of these thermochemical pathways. The question is about pyrolysis, which is. Uh, for the non-science people, pyrolysis is just basically a lot of heat converting the chemical into another chemical. Um, and that's the problem. It's a lot of heat. It's a lot of energy um, and very costly to set up. Um, there is a great process, we are looking into it, where you convert, uh, we're converting our glycerin through that process into acrylic acid, plexiglass. It takes 500 degrees Fahrenheit of heat to do that. That is a lot of energy. So the product has to be a high value product. It costs a lot of energy to make it, so it has to cost a lot of money to sell it. With fermentation process, well, you all you all drink Bud Light that's 50 cents a can. Um, yeast can be produced even cheaper than that. It's a, it's a very, it's a long process. It takes time, but if you set it up right and with a large space, it takes lots of space and lots of time but you're working in cubic feet for, for yeast and bacteria. So unlike algae where you have to have square feet or growing food, you have square feet. How many square feet of land do you have? How many square feet of, of growing area do you have for algae? With yeast, you have cubic feet. If you take the cubic feet of this room, we have a lot of space. Question? Did I hear you right that uh you can put up to 6% ethanol in your engine without a modification. Uh, and then I have okay. something to follow up with. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm pretty sure I read on a gas pump that um, the, it said this fuel contains up to 10% ethanol. So can you reconcile those two? Well, 10% is just what we are supposed to put in. And the question is, did you hear me right, that we can do 60%? Yes, Australia is currently doing 60%. Oh, you said 60. 60. Oh, I thought you said 60. No, 60%. Oh, it's a misunderstanding. You thought I said 6. We can put 60% ethanol into our engine with no modification. You get less power, and, and you get some fouling of your plugs after a while. You get you got to change things out, but you can do it. Um, now, do I recommend doing it all the time? No. Um, modification of the injectors is what's needed, especially fuel injected engines. Um, from your point of view, what's the biggest limiting factor in more widespread use of biodiesel? One word for the limiting use of biodiesel is feedstock. How much can, I mean, what is our consumption? 64 billion gallons of diesel fuel in, in the United States alone. We don't have that much feedstock. We have to change the way we do things if we want to go completely bio on, on our thing. Um, it can mitigate. N it's not a solution. It's an answer for the short term. Um, we have to come up with solutions over for the long term. And when I mean short term, it's good for 30, 50 years. And then we're going to come up with something better. Science is always evolving, always changing. And I'm sure 50 years ago, the, the idea of running out of oil was almost obsolete. This is one of the things that I'm obsessed with but haven't had any chance to research yet, and that is when are we going to start mining our landfills for resources, and are the resources that are in landfills from the last 100 years going to be worth anything from your perspective for biodiesel or other fuels? It's a very good question. When are we going to mine our waste streams that we currently have? The current landfills are not going to be any good for really fuels. They're going to be good for compost because they've been broken down. Um, they're going to be good for iron and, and um, 
you know, the material minerals that we've thrown away, especially aluminum, because it's it takes 800 times more energy to extract aluminum than it is to recycle. So I hope you all recycling your aluminum cans. But um, yeah, the the, w the landfills are our, one of our biggest issues, and the biggest thing we can tap in our landfills right now is the methane gas production. Most of the methane gas production in our landfills is just being burned off at night. And by capturing that gas and using it for production of, of electricity would save us a lot of money and a lot of energy. You had a chart up there showing the tons of waste coming out of the city per year. How much biodiesel would that generate? And also, if you had a, a vat the size of this room full of yeast, how much biodiesel would that generate per year? Now you're asking me to do math. <laughs> um, well, I can tell you the short answer. It's about 40 million gallons from our waste stream right there. Per year, we could produce 40 million gallons from our waste just in the city of Seattle. Uh, that is a good question. I don't know the answer. I think probably what's the, question? the question is, what's the usage of diesel fuel in Seattle? The Metro bus alone uses 18 million gallons. The state fuel fairly uses the equivalent to that. And the Washington State all together uses a billion gallons. So it's just a small Washington State uses a billion gallons of fuel is the answer to that. How much fuel do we use? Diesel fuel is a billion gallons annu annually. So 35 million gallons is not fixing the problem. It is helping it, but it's not fixing it. This room, um, well, if we go back to the chart here, you, you get a 60% yield from food waste. So if this room was filled with yeast, then you, you'd have to figure out the liters and cubic feet and everything. And I don't have all the numbers for that. So, But you could produce, um, probably, if you use this size room for a bioreactor, You'd be looking at around 2 million, maybe 3 million gallons a year you could produce. Um, I, I'm wondering if you could talk about the how biodiesel burns. Um, if I took a liter of biodiesel, compared it to a liter of regular diesel, um, how, how do the emissions compare? And I guess, also, given that um, maybe you have to use more than one liter of biodiesel, um, are you still having any gains on improved emissions? If I understand the question right, you're asking me, how does emissions improve with biodiesel? And is it actually, is it a positive emission improvement? The short answer is there's no difference. Really, I mean, you're going to hear studies on both ends of the, of the board that biodiesel's worse, that diesel fuel's worse. The carcinogenic factor, though, for biodiesel is a lot less than that of diesel fuel. So if you're smelling diesel fumes, you're more likely to get cancer than you are with biodiesel. Uh, that's, uh, that's the biggest thing. The nitrous oxide emissions from biodiesels are higher, but the carbon monoxide emission from diesel fuel is higher. So, I mean, it's kind of a wash when you're looking at the emissions themselves, but if you're looking at what it does for an environmental impact and the human impact, the carcinogenics, there is no carcinogenic factors in biodiesel. The LD50 of biodiesel is four gallons. You have to drink four gallons and then 50% will die. That's what LD50 means. 50% of people exposed to it will die. And so, and if anybody's drinking four gallons of biodiesel, we got a lot of other problems than them just drinking bio <laughs> biodiesel. Can you comment on the uh, recent EPA ruling on biodiesel? Um, I think they, uh, if I remember, I just read the summary. I didn't read the whole thing, but they were um, they had some negative comments on it. I think didn't City of Seattle pull using biodiesel on their buses? Well, the soybeans. EPA just had a study on the soybean-based biodiesel, how it wasn't as environmentally friendly. We are using, in, in general biodiesel, waste oil. We collect the restaurant grease. All your fries have been fried in it, everything fried here. So we are using a waste stream that is not a soy based, well, that's not plant based in, in the way of, of first generation. It's, it's waste stream itself. It's already been used for food. It's now thrown away into a garbage container. 
and then we take that garbage and make a fuel out of it. So we are actually energy positive in that. We are energy returned to the, com to the society. We are environmentally friendly because if that waste oil gets thrown into the, uh, into the landfill, you are producing a lot more carbon monoxide, a lot more bad chemicals, the, it gets into the water. Even though it's just food oil, into the water it makes an emulsion, killing fish, killing plants and animals in it. So we are taking a product that if it went to the landfill, would be bad into something very good for the community and society and the environment. And uh, in your opinion, whoa, sorry, that's really loud, or maybe not loud at all. Um, in your opinion, what will the evolution of alternative fuels result in? Like, what is what do you think we are all working towards in terms of a sustainable solution for running cars and buildings and trucks and stuff like that? Where is biofuels going in the future? I think it's going to hydrogen in the future. That's future though, that's not now. That's 10 years, maybe 15 years in the future, maybe 20, it takes time. Science is great, but it's slow. Um, there's lots of testing, there's lots of ideas. Science are used to failures. I, I said, that I, I say women prepare me the best to be a scientist because even though I, I was told no a lot, I still ask the question. The thing about um, science is we fail a lot, but we keep going at it, we keep trying, and we'll come up with a solution. Hydrogen gives us our best energy return. The now is ethanol, and biodiesel. The now, right now, in the next 10 years, is going to be ethanol and biodiesel. Biodiesel especially because we're not asking anybody to change. People want change. You all want to change the world here and make it a better place. You just don't want to change to do it. You still want to claim in your car and go down the road. If you bought a diesel Jetta, you could get 55 miles to the gallon and buy biodiesel for the same price of diesel fuel, saving you lots of money and being able to go anywhere you want to go and not change your lifestyle. Any more questions? Oh. I'm not sure uh, I really understood what you were saying was going to happen with the yeast and the, the, the byproducts of the actual producing the biodiesel from yeast. Well, yeast itself is, is work, yeast and E. coli are a workhorse of, of our biotech science. Me being a biochemist, that's what I deal with. Antibiotics, insulin, a whole bunch of stuff is produced through yeast. Um, there's entire companies, multi-billion dollars companies, revolving around a few yeast bioreactors producing drugs. Yeast produce, yeast genetically can be engineered very easily, produce whatever we want it to produce. So if you take some genetic engineering, they didn't do genetic engineering for this strain of yeast, incidentally. This is just natural selection. If you just do a little bit of genetic engineering, you can increase the yield producing other chemicals besides just the fat. You want them to produce a high amount of fat. Every cell has a fat lipid layer around it to keep water out and what it, what it has inside of it in the cell. That's where we have our fat cells. A lot, a lot of our fat is within our cells itself keeping what we want in the cells in the cell itself. So we extract that fat back out, same way that you extract the min oil from mint, just steam and, and water and you just let the, and, and blast it and blow up the cell and you can extract that fat. But all the other peptides and proteins and chemicals that are in that cell can be used. What is petroleum? Petroleum is millions of years of yeast and bacteria and plant matter being crushed down steamed by the earth's pressure and heat, thermally cracked down to produce the chemicals. If we take a vat full of yeast, throw it and steam it, we can produce every chemical that we get out of oil now out of a batch of yeast. Hi, uh, can you hear me? 
Um, I'm kind of new. This is my first meeting like this, but I've uh, been environmentally aware for a while. One thing I'm hearing the vegetarians say is if people just went vegetarian, we could uh, take care of a huge problem with uh, global emissions. Is that? Can you explain a little about that? The question is, is, is if we went vegetarian, how would that save the world? Um, well, uh, the short answer is we all are meat eaters in America. We eat a lot of meat. It's not going to happen. The, the, but the, the answer is yes, it would save a lot of emissions because we would ha grow less cows, grow less food for the cows because it takes a lot of energy to make a cow for a burger. But I like my steak. Um, <laughs> I do. i got to admit to it. Um, and it's not going to change anything. And getting on a soapbox and preaching about something for change is not going to change the world. Because I always come back to this. As a scientist, everybody wants to have change. We just don't want to change to do it. We want to be able to do, go and get that hamburger from the stand and know it can be done. We can genetically, if we wanted to, we could genetically alter yeast to produce the same protein that as a cow does and, and make yeasty burgers. Probably taste the same, but I don't know if I would eat a yeast burger or not, even if I made it. The question is, uh, she's made a comment, a lot of us are willing to change. And I applaud you, and I would assist you in any way I could to, make, to allow you to t make that change. Um, but I'm, I'm looking at what we have currently and how do we use what we currently have. And if somebody can advocate that change and change the world, I applaud him for that. And Gandhi did it. And it was one man doing it. So one man, one woman can make the difference. A good plant takes 2% of its energy in and converts it into something you can eat. A cow takes 30% of its energy in and converts it into something you can eat. If you look at what cropland you are using for cows, they often are fed most of their life on grasslands you're not going to grow anything else on. You can feed them at the end if you want on corn, but most of it's on grass. So it's kind of a funny calculation. Um, the thing I keep coming back to in my day-to-day um, -day thinking about some of these issues has to do with we very little hear about the externalized cost of things. And when you look at, and maybe this is asking you to put on the financial hat. You've been wearing all these other hats tonight. but um, So petroleum is artificially cheap because it's subsidized in the fact that we don't, that they externalize the cost to the environment. Um, so what would you think needs to be done in order for biofuels to be on even, even footing with petroleum? Uh, are you in support of higher gas taxes? Do you want to see more subsidies of biofuels? What do you think is the best mix? Or maybe from the people that you work with, what their attitude is? Well, I keep hearing the question is, is financially, how do we make biodiesel and biofuels more acceptable and, and, and competitive with pro petroleum products. The tax breaks are there. The, the, the tax credits that we get are there. The tax credits are necessary. I keep hearing it from our CFO. Keep the tax credits. Um, they give us an edge that we need to compete because we're competing against multi-billion dollars corporations and we're working in millions of dollars. They're working in billions of dollars with already established infrastructure. We're trying to establish our infrastructure. The biggest thing is the community support with infrastructure and the willingness to use it. Um, everybody that's willing to use it is there. And Seattle's a great place because they are willing to use it and try it. Um, and they're willing to pay for it. Uh, to go green, we have to pay the price. Nothing's free. So it's going to cost us more money to be a green society and not kill the environment. The question is, is we make the same emissions. Is it any cleaner? 
it's cleaner on the front end because we're not environmentally drilling. The state of Texas has dropped 20 feet in elevation from all the oil they pumped out. The contamination of water supply by all the oil in Argentina, it just you, I could go on and on to the environmental impact that oil has caused on the ground, not in the air, but on the ground. <coughs> the drilling of oil is, is, kills the planet. I mean, as we transport this stuff around, it becomes, it's so toxic in carcinogenic effect that it's just, it's not just about the emissions in the air, it's also the carcinogenic effect of burning fuel. There's benzene, there's so many carcinogenic agents in gasoline and diesel that we wonder why we have so much cancer in our society. I can, we have a tailpipe running by us every second of the day. I mean, there, there's your answer. We can change this by changing the way we burn and what we burn and eventually going into a cleaner fuel source such as hydrogen and, and, and putting the public support to give the scientists the grants and the funding to make the ultimate clean fuel there. But people have to be willing to pay a price to get there. The guy that knows finance was... I'm not a finance guy. I actually flunked down math. Um, my name is Yale Wong. I'm the chief volunteer at General Biodiesel. Um, to answer your question, um, in Washington State, when we make um, biodiesel fuel, we can make it cheaper or the same price as diesel fuel. And that's the reason why is we take a local waste and we make it energy. We don't have to grow it, pay the farmer to harvest that, et cetera. So we give an incentive to the restaurant. We tell them, you know, that you're contributing by giving us your waste, and we give you $0.05, cents, $0.10 cents a gallon to say thanks instead of charging them $40 a pickup like the garbage company does. So we're a very pos energy positive company. The reason why biodiesel today costs more than regular diesel is because Washington State buys their biodiesel from the Midwest. So it costs 50 cents to 75 cents a gallon just to transport that fuel. We like to collect here locally, produce here locally, and sell it locally, made here in Washington State for Washingtonians to, and, and, and clean up the environment at the same time. And that's how we keep the prices down. We don't have to transport it. Hello. How, do you ever, how will you ever get it out of the neighborhoods? You're collecting from the restaurants today. How are you going to go out into Kent Federal Way, Bellevue, and get it from the suburbia? That's a good question. I'm sorry for stealing the limelight from you. But um, we are starting a brand new program. You can go on the Seattle.gov site that we're starting a brand new program to put um, um, waste bins in certain locations. We have one in front of our facility where everybody can centrally dump off. I'm going to be um, trying to work with uh, Whole Foods or PCC on getting them to adopt our program, putting a, uh, a waste bin at their facility in maybe the back area where everybody can just contribute and dump off their, you know, turkey fryer oil or rotisserie grease. So I hope that helps. You in the back. Um, this is getting more into the sciencey part, but I was just wondering, so you said the yeast breaks down the cellulose. That, is that what you said? Yeast breaks down cellulose? Yeah, so I was just wondering how exactly it, it, it's doing that, if it's encoding the enzymes that break down cellulose, or what's going on? Well, the short answer is yeast is a fungus. We've all seen mushrooms grow on trees. Yeast use the same m metabolic pathways that mushrooms use to break down cellulosic waste. So it, it's, um, they were using here is called red yeast. We've all had seen the red rice that we get, uh, and that's just the yeast breaking down the outside rice kernel, <laughs> breaking down the cellulose. Um, coming back to the, the comparison of what you're doing with locally produced waste oil to make biodiesel and what's happening with the burning of rainforest to grow soybeans and such. You know, I heard the comment a few minutes ago that um, making biodiesel is not degrading the environment, but that's only in your case. That's not the overall picture, is from what I understand. Um, what is the percentage of, as far as biodiesel production, what percentage of biodiesel produced is done 
in the manner that you're doing it versus the large corporations uh, shipping it from all over the world and doing, making it from soybeans and not being sustainable. That's a very good question. Sustainability of biodiesel. Um, that's why I put up the waste in the waste story of Seattle. That's the sustainable way. Our waste streams are is our sustainable way. I don't know the exact percentage, but I do know that every biodiesel company out there that was working last year producing biodiesel from agricultural, like soybean, palm, things like that, are currently not really producing that much because it costs too much to produce. They can't break even. Unless diesel fuels around 450 a gallon, they can't produce. It costs that much for them to produce the oil and just to break even. So that's the sustainability factor is why we do our waste stream and waste oil from the restaurants at first. And then moving into other waste streams at, from there is because it is sustainable. It, we have control of the feedstock. It's local. It's already been used. It's waste. And it it's makes money. And in business, if you're not making money, you're not surviving. I think you touched on this already, but are there other byproducts besides the fuel that could be marketed, repackaged? I'm thinking along the lines of petroleum companies, obviously they're not making all their money on gas, they're making the money on lubricants and all sorts of other things. Uh, the question is uh, other products for biodiesel, ethanol, butanol, things like that. Yes, we currently sell biodiesel as a part washer. Um, it's it's uh, reformulated, so it it, it uh, ha is a little bit le more liquid and allows for a better washing of the parts. Instead of using petroleum-based products to degrease something, you can use a bio-based product, um, which is great. Uh, it's degra biodegradable, of course, because biodiesel is biodegradable. Um, the glycerin can be turned into uh, a whole bunch of different products, uh, polyesters to acrylics to... Um, Biochemicals, it, cosmetics, uh, soaps that we make can be turned into lipstick. All you ladies are wearing lipstick tonight. You're basically wearing soap on your face, um, and so that's that's where I mean all of our products can be used, and it has an, uh, an outlet for everything. It's a matter of changing our attitude to find cheap stuff and buying and looking at the bio alternatives because petroleum is so cheap. Currently, when you distill petroleum, you get 46% to gasoline, 23% to um, diesel fuel, and the rest is tar and, and stuff. They go through a coking process, a thermal cracking process, produce more gasoline, produce other chemicals, steam cracking. So all the technology to produce these chemicals from the, our waste stream, it's already been developed. It's done, in the, it's done in the petroleum plants already. We just need to apply that technology to bio-based fuels and our, and our bioproduction. Yeah, I was just wondering if your um, your company, General um, Biodiesel, is doing any research in using yeast and cellulose for, I know you're using the waste oil, but are you actually researching this? <coughs> are we doing any research? Well, I'd be a poor scientist if I wasn't doing any research. Of course we're doing research. Um, and we're, we're researching all the waste streams. We have a couple good waste streams identified. Locally, we're trying to turn uh, a lot of our local waste streams into a high-value product. Um, there's a lot of low-value products in our waste streams, such as compost. We put our, which City of Seattle is a great place, we do that. We put our compost, our yard waste in, and we go compost and then put it back on our lawns. We're great and green, but that's a very low-value product. It actually doesn't even break even. We subsidize that. But by taking a waste stream and making it into fuel, it can make money and it, the public doesn't have to subsidize it. 